no matter what. That ball's close to you, dive and try to catch it. If you miss it, you miss it. But so many kids are afraid to fail that they'd rather not try for that really tough play because they might miss it instead of just going, you know, I'm going all out and, and whatever. I, 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 I'm, I'm giving it everything I have. And then hustle. You know, there, there, there's, you know, hustling no matter what happens. You're hustling on the field. You're hustling off the field. You're the first one in the ball bucket. You're the first one to pick up every single ball. You're just, you're, you're, your attention to detail is very important. Welcome back to the Baseball Playground. This is your host, Jacob Odell. Coach Matt McGowan. And today we have the owner, founder, absolute legend, Duke Baxter, owner of Zone Sports Academy, who's just been killing it over on the East Coast. Duke, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, man. I see so much of your guys and stuff out there. Your content's awesome. The messaging is awesome. And when you guys asked me to be on the show, I was so excited. I'm like, let's go. We're excited you're here. Thanks so much for being here. Um, right out the gate, you run probably one of the most successful uh, indoor academies in the country. Talk to us about it. How did you start this journey? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, I started in 2002, but prior to that, I've always always loved giving lessons, always loved working with kids. And it seemed like every year after high school, the high school coach would be like, ask all the guys to come back and work summer camps and do those sort of things, give little talks. And, and back then it was like, I hated to talk. I didn't, you know, it was just pretty much scared to be, to do any public speaking, but man, did I love teaching the kids and giving back to the stuff that I learned and, you know, once you started playing pro ball, I always was doing stuff, you know, in the off season and giving lessons. And then in 2002, when I knew uh, my time's kind of winding down, what about continuing to do this, right? Because it's almost like your identity has gone when you're a baseball player and then you no longer play. You're like, wait, what am I now? Like, like, w w what am I going to do? I'm, I only know baseball, right? And now it's like, everyone's like, what are you going to do for a living? And I'm like, I never thought about that because I thought I was going to make it to the big leagues and that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. But when that didn't happen, it was like, okay, what do I know? I know the game of baseball. I love coaching and I love teaching it. And so do all the other guys that I'm playing with. So when I was playing on the Somerset Patriots, I had like four of the guys come back and we trained in the off season and we, you know, they worked with us and, you know, so really in 2002, it started. So this year, May 9th will be our 20th year of being open and, you know, pretty much just doing what we love doing, you know, baseball, softball, all ages, all skill levels, and, and just giving back to the game that we love, you know, like what better thing than that? Yeah, it's awesome. You have so many young athletes, just young people who are trying to grow all together. And one of the things I want to touch on is the coaches community that you've actually been developing because you actually are helping a lot of the coaches themselves of how they can be better coaches especially at the youth age, because that's something that's lacking overall of just, you know, the dads who are coaching their kids who maybe are playing favorites, maybe just don't know what they're doing to that extent. So run me through the, the actual coaching camps and clinics that you are running. Sure. Yeah. So during COVID um, was like the first time that I didn't know how to make money doing what I do. Right. You weren't allowed to give private lessons because you weren't allowed to be with kids. Uh, we couldn't you know, come inside. We were closed for six months. So the whole facility was shut down. So there was no team training. There was like nothing. And I was just, we were just like, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to keep this place? How are we going to survive during this? So we actually started and took all the knowledge and all the videos that we had and just started creating courses. So we started creating online coaching courses. So we started dominate the diamond and, you know, it started out with just a majors course. So it was pretty much you know, six to seven year olds that were just starting out and then seven to eight, nine to 10, you know, now we have 12 court, we have 12 courses from T-ball all the way up to advanced levels. We have the mental conditioning courses. Now we have softball courses, slap hitting courses, like everything you can think of, but it's like the ABCs and one, two, threes of coaching. And the reason why we did it was we wrote a book called taking on the title of coach, Steve Nickrack and myself, because so many coaches were like, what do I do? You know, I have an eight-year-old that said, hey, daddy, will you be my coach? And I never played. I never touched a baseball, but I say yes. Well, now what happens? And we know that coaching the game is hard enough if you know what you're doing. When you don't know what you're doing, you know, 12 kids on a field with baseball, it's like it's called the boring sport as it is already. 
you know? So how do we keep the kids engaged? How do we keep them having fun? How do we keep them, you know, organized? So we started creating practice plans and coaches clinics. And next thing you know, all these coaches just started asking all these questions that we thought were so simple, but we're like, gosh, it's not simple if you never played before. Like, so, you know, so, so that's what we did. So we, 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 we took it from A to Z and, you know, so people like our videos cause we, we take skills and just make them simple, you know? And that's where, you know, we started a Facebook page and I was just posting one video a day during COVID just, Hey, here's how you teach a kid that's, you know, not getting in front of the ball to get in front of the ball. And next, you know, one of the, one of the guys like, dude, how, you, did you know you have 150,000 followers on Facebook? I'm like, no, I don't even know. I didn't even know that. And then it was 200,000. Then it was, and I'm like, that's not what we, that, that's not why I'm doing it to build the following. It was, I'm just posting a video a day and Steve and I were coming up with ideas. And next, you know, we're like, dude, this is a community. Like, this is pretty big. Like w- there's a lot of people that, that want this. So, so <laughs> here we are, right? So now we have zoned our brick and mortar facility, but then we have dominate the diamond that has a community of like 275,000 people that are coaches going, I need help with my five-year-old. How do I keep my six-year-old engaged when, you know, how do I get my seven-year-old to, to not be scared when they get in the batter's box because they went from coach pitch to player pitch and now they're all scared to get hit by the ball. Like those little things that you and I would be like, that's a good question. Or how do you know if a kid's a lefty or a righty? Like <laughs> those are things that we never thought about. But when a five-year-old comes to you like this and he comes walking on the field, you're like, what? okay, I got to figure out an answer to this. So we try to give as many tips and tricks as we can. You're bringing up like I, I you're you're so right. It, it's not even funny. I'm coaching my daughter. My daughter's five years old. I'm coaching. I'm assistant coaching her uh, her t-ball team. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there's you know I'm getting questions asked to me like, what about this? What about that? And and I love it. It's great. But it, to us, it's like. We should be, we, I mean, how do you not know this stuff? But one thing I thought you brought up that, that is so true, like, you know, the parent that we have, he's, he's a great guy. You know, I, I don't think he's coached baseball before, but he wanted to do it. He volunteered. He, you know, and I think that's the first step to, to, to the teams. It obviously is having volunteers, but our big thing for me, when I, when I came to the practices was parents have to be involved. If they're not involved, then they need to lower their expectations Right. Because if they're not involved, then, yeah, we're not going to have, you know, the stations run the right way. But if you're going to be at practice, put a ball on the tee. You, you, you can do that. You don't have to teach them how to hit or do anything like that. But I think your videos, Dominate the Diamond, all that stuff. I mean, we, we promote that, you know, at the T-ball level for all these guys. Like, hey, make sure you're looking into this stuff because if they have a base of what's going on, it's only going to make the community of baseball better. You know, it, I think it's interesting because it's like we did this uh, this clinic in Montgomery and they bring us out there because they, they're doing like a whole league revamp. They're losing 20 percent of their kids every year. It's it's everywhere, though. Right. It's not just this town or this town. It's it's like baseball as a whole is like the numbers in rec are really declining. And so we go out there and I'm like, listen, there's a hundred kids out here that are six and seven year olds. And I bring all the parents together and I'm like, I go into the middle with all the kids around me and I show a drill. I'm like, okay, parents, grab two little smush balls, grab four kids and do this drill. And then they scatter on the field. Then I blow the whistle. They all come back in and I show another simple drill. And the parents are like, oh, wow, like this isn't that hard. I'm like, you're right. It's not that hard. But no one invests in the rookie coach. No one in, everyone wants to invest in the high school coach, the middle school coach. There's clinics for the ABCA convention, which we all go to because we know how important that is. But who's going to invest in that six-year-old dad that has no clue? And that's the guy. And I tell this every time I have a coach's clinic, whether you guys like it or not, you're the ones that are either going to get these 12 kids to fall in love with the game or to quit the game. And they look at me like, I'm like, you're the ones, because if it's boring, they're not going to play next year. If they like it, they're going to play another year. So it's not how many trophies you win. It's how many kids do you get to sign up again next year? And they're like, okay. I'm like, if your team is 500, but they all can't wait to come to practice to see Coach Duke or Coach Joe or Coach Jim, guess what? Like, 
That's it. Not, well, we won seven trophies this year, but nobody wants to play for me. Well, then you're a bad coach. Yeah. Like, that's not what coaching is. You know? So, investing in the those young T-ball slash coach pitch coaches that are just starting, we need to get those kids to love it so they keep on playing. Right? So... So that's something that we really try to go after is the leagues and the coaches. It's like every parent is a potential coach, but they don't know it yet. But if you teach them how to easy it is and how to keep it simple, now they're like, I can coach. Oh, I can coach. It's like, yes, that's what we need. Cause we need four or five coaches as you know, in each on each team, you need to have like three or four people to run stations and stuff. Like if you only have one guy, he can be amazing. But if he's got 12, six year olds, yeah, you're hurting. Right. You're hurting cats at that point. <laughs> yes, sir. You uh, you're talking about just simplifying everything, and that's a huge aspect in baseball. Is just keeping it down to the simple tasks at hand, and doing the simple things. So whether it's coaching or you know you're working with players, what are some of the simple things that players can do? to start their development on their own time and not have a field. Cause I know in the East coast, you know, you got the weather, you got other circumstances that restrict you. So what are some simple drills, simple things that kids can do on their own? I love that. So another thing, you know, when, when we were stuck inside and couldn't do things, we created a wall ball course and it's 57 drills of everything you can do with a ball and a wall. I posted a video today of, uh, of Coach Steve. He's got his knees on a plyo ball and he's actually playing catch with a tennis ball off the wall, balancing himself on this big like yoga ball just for athleticism and focus and balance. Um, I was taking a ball and I was throwing it off of the plyo ball. And as you know, since it's round, the ball's ricocheting all over the place and I'm moving my feet, catching it, throwing it just to show people like, listen, there's so much that you can do with very little you just need to know what to do. Taking a ball and throwing it off the wall like we all used to do. We used to play chicken all the time. Yeah, it was a different game, but it was just a ball, a wall. You're playing catch, you're throwing. You know, so, you know, if you have a T, there's a ton of drills that you can work on just with the T. If you want to work on throwing, hey, taking a tennis ball or a baseball or something and throwing it, at, you know, into a target or off a wall. And, you know, so I think wall ball is, a, is something that kids can all do and it's so easy ground balls, fly balls. You can toss it high, drop step and, and go. You can, you know, get really low and toss the ball and frame it as a catcher. You can work on blocking. Like there's so many things you can get a person behind you to throw the ball off the wall to work on react reactions and reflexes. And if you're a catcher, the ball comes over your shoulder, goes off the wall, and now you're working on framing and blocking. So I think that, you know, with a partner and a tennis ball on a wall, you can almost do anything. I think you bring up some great points. I think, I think that also is what separates players, right? It's those guys that are doing the wall ball stuff. It's the guys that are just putting in the extra time, no matter, Hey, it's snowing. So what, you know, we're going to do what we have to do as somebody who's seen a lot of players go through your, your program. What separates those guys from good to elite um, and, and go, you know, going forward. I love that. It's, it, it's the guys that, uh, that don't make excuses. It's the guys that, uh, that don't complain. It's the guys that, you know, just, just they're, they're gritty. Like they just find ways. They, it's not, Oh, you know, the ball's wet. So I made a, th Hey, so what? Okay. Hey guys, you know, I coach a 12 year old team right now. I said, guys, we know the ball's going to be wet. We know the mound is very flat. We know the lines aren't straight today, but guess what? We got to catch it, field it, throw it, hit it. And that's what we have to do. You know, so we have to be able to make adjustments. So I think great players make adjustments. They're adaptable. They know how to, they continue to hustle and give effort at all times. And they have a very short, um, you know, their, their attention is focused, but yet they say, so what next pitch so fast? Like they have the bounce back factor. That's like, oh, I missed the ball, but I'm going to catch the next one. You know, because the training that they put in builds the confidence to where they can dominate in anything, you know, nothing. It's when you don't practice or, you know, you haven't put the work in. Well, now when there's a runner on second base and you're up, you're, you're a little nervous when you put the work in all day long and you're like, dude, runner on second base. I, I die for this situation. I visualize this all the time. Like, this is why I practice, 
You know, you practice and we used to do it when we were kids all the time. We used to take the ball or throw it up and hit it and be like, the bases are loaded with two outs. You know, you live for those moments of like just being in that pressure situation. And when you have the confidence, it's just another situation. But when you don't have the confidence and you haven't put in the time and, you know, then that's when the situation just eats you alive because you're stressed out over it instead of wanting it. I think that's what makes, you know, separates the, the good from the great. What advice do you give to your players? Like, what's the best advice you think you give to your guys? That's a good question. I, I think I always say attitude, hustle, and effort all the time. You have to have a good – your attitude is what drives everything, right? Like, you could be having a bad day. You, did a, you got a bad grade on your test. You, you know, when you get into between the white lines, you have to be able to get rid of that and, and be focused and locked in. So your attitude all the time when things are good or when things are bad – how do I just rebound myself, pick up my teammates, and help the team win? Because that is what's going to help you become a better player because of the fact that when things aren't going well, they're going to pick you up because you're that guy. They're going to call you a captain before the coach calls you a captain. They're going to feel like you're, you're, you uplift the entire team. So the attitude's huge. The effort, I, you know, effort is just you know, something that just everyone talks about. And it's just nonstop all the time, just giving it everything you have, no matter what. That ball's close to you, dive and try to catch it. If you miss it, you miss it. But so many kids are afraid to fail that they'd rather not try for that really tough play because they might miss it instead of just going, you know, I'm going all out and, and whatever. I gotta, I, I'm, I'm giving it everything I have. And then hustle. You know, there, there there's... You know, hustling no matter what happens. You're hustling on the field. You're hustling off the field. You're the first one of the ball bucket. You're the first one to pick up every single ball. You're just, you're, you're, your attention to detail is very important. We always say that. The dugout's got to be clean. All the balls are picked up from the batting cage. There's a reason why we hustle to pick up the balls when we're, when we're in the cages so we can get more swings. There's a reason why we hustle to the right field line so we can get more ground balls and more fly balls. There's a reason why... You know, the dugout is a certain way and then we we shake the umpire's hand and the other team's hand and respect the game because you never know when it's going to be over. You know, we all have we, we all have a, that time where you, you no longer can play anymore. And it's like that's the worst day. But if you're playing every game with attitude, effort and hustle, you have no regrets. You're absolutely right. I, I mean, I tell my guys don't ever get out hustled because that's such a huge separator. What advice would you give to parents that are that put a lot of pressure on their kids? You know, we deal with that a lot as coaches. We deal with that a lot at the at the high school level. Um, I feel like a lot of kids fail because they're so worried about the car ride home rather than the actual at bat or the or, or you know what's going or the actual play that's going on. Yeah, the, I, I we see that all the time, and I said this in the coaches' clinic the other day. It was about eighty five coaches, and I said I want you guys to and gals when you're in this clinic and you're in the fielding portion with me and I ask you to step to the front and be like the three players that are going to do the drill I want you to think of what it feels like and the pressure that you have on yourself that you might make a mistake that these other coaches might laugh that these other coach might make fun of the way you do something I want you to think about what that's like because that is what your son or daughter feel like when they're on the baseball field and they're on the pitcher's mound and you're yelling throw strikes like they know throw strikes. The hitter's trying to get a hit and drive the ball. So we need to be careful with the words that we say. Instead, it's got to be those words have to be very specific. Hey, hit it hard, Johnny. Hey, pound that strike zone. Let's go. Let it rip. Keep your eyes on the glove. Like you're not saying throw a strike. Don't hit a ground ball, you know, don't swing and miss like, you know, so I think the parents put so much pressure because they don't understand so many times you'll have a pro guy will come in here and we'll work with their kids and the pro guys like he's going to get coffee like he knows like it's your time right now. Right. But then you have the helicopter parent that's right in the in the cage, like screaming and yelling when you're trying to talk. I'm like, hold on a second. If you want to come in here instead feel free to come in here. But this is my time with your son and daughter. We're, there's so much mental side of this game that they need to be able to focus on what's happening. You know, so I, I think it's, man, I, I see that all the time and we really, 
really put in time and effort to get the parents as a whole to, to, to lock in and allow us to do what we do. You just mentioned that you have a lot of pro guys that, you know, occasionally do come into the facility and the younger guys get to see that. And I bet that's a huge, just exemplary, exemplary, you know, visualization for them where they can actually see the, the high end caliber players. Um, so what kind of advice do you ever see or attributes or characteristics from the pro guys that you can let the younger generation know about? I think it's so interesting because, uh, Anthony Volpe used to train here and we're all Yankees fans. And now he's, you know, with the Yankees shorts up and people would always say to me, like, did you know he was going to be a first round pick? And I was like, no. But one thing I can tell you is that in the four years that his team came and trained, I've never seen Anthony Volpe not be the first one here to practice on Sunday. And I never saw him make a mistake. Like he, we would do flips and while other kids were goofing around, Anthony was so fundamentally sound and he paid attention to detail so much. And when he did give a behind the back flip, he threw it to you right here. It wasn't, oh, oh, you know, oh, a guy between the legs. And no, if he did anything that was a little uncalculated, it was still perfect. And you're like, dude, this guy, I've never seen him miss a ground ball. And I've never seen him not flip and follow with perfect form. I've never, I never saw him just kind of, he never went through the motions. Like everything he did was like, and I was like, holy cow, when I think about that, that's what a first round pick is. A guy that pays attention to detail. He's locked in at all times. He gets there early. He stays late. He's, you know, he's calculated with all of his movements and they practice so much that I never, I, I, I've never seen him make a mistake. So, you know, I think that is what, when you see guys come in, even the, you know, the college players and the pro guy, like they all have routines. They all have programs that they don't just go in here and start firing balls like a, a nine-year-old would or get their radar gun out and see if they can hit 80 miles an hour on the gun. Like they don't do that kind of stuff. They spend 30 minutes to get themselves ready and on point. And then they throw their 20 pit. Like it's very regimented. And I think that's what some of these guys see. But when you look on social media, it's everything's about the stats and the numbers and the swag and the they don't realize what's behind. When you peel that onion back, they don't see what's behind and underneath that onion. They only see the the stuff that happens now. But that guy's grinded for 10 years, 12 years. That's how he's that good. He didn't just wake up one day and be like, here we go. I'm going to be Mike Trout today. I want to be Bryce Harper today. Like Those guys talk about it all the time, how, how much mental goes into it, how much practice, how much training. So I think that's one of the biggest things that I see when the pro guys or college guys come in here that can teach the younger guys is watch my routine. You have so many colleges on the East coast, small ones, big ones, D threes, NAIAs. Um, and it's all kind of in a small, you know, Northeast section where you have all these schools. What separates, you know, what, what how do guys come to your, your facility and, and separate themselves from the others when these colleges are in, you know, in your facility or, or coming to see these players? You know, I, I, I'm always, I'm a big believer of, you know, what can you do to stand out? You know, if you throw 80 miles an hour and you're a right-handed pitcher and you're a junior in high school, guess what? Every single kid's throwing 80 miles an hour as a junior in high school. But if you want to go to that school, number one, what are your, what are your grades like? Is that going to separate you from the other guy, you know, is that something? Okay, how about your communication or your attitude and how you walk onto the field? Do you walk on there all buttoned up, ready to go, like to where that guy's like, huh, this guy looks like something? Or the way that you talk to your teammates and the way that you're you're hustling on the field and the way like you got to do something differently because if you do go on there and you're throwing eighty, but you do all those other things, it's like, dude, this guy's got something. He's, he's going to help make my team better. He's going to help the other guys that are on the team. He's going to help them get better. This is the guy I want. Maybe he's not going to start right away. I think he's got something, but man, I'll work every day of the week with a guy like that over the guy that throws 88 and thinks he's all that. And when the, and when the chips are on the table and he gives up one hit, he'd rather go like this and, oh, my arms hurt today. I, I don't feel it. Like, and you're seeing that all the time, I think. I think coaches see that a lot now to where 
you know, the stats and the numbers of what this guy shows, but it doesn't show what's in here. And then all of a sudden they go watch him and a couple of things go wrong or an error. And now you see the guy that was, you know, now balls are flying all over the place. He has no resiliency and no gut inside. And now you're like, dude, I got an 88 mile an hour throwing, like he doesn't do me any good. You know, then you got the other guy that's maybe a little 82 to 84, but man, this guy just gets out. He's gritty. He's, you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. so I think it's, what can you do to help yourself stand out? And it, maybe it's not the miles per hour in your arm, but how much movement do you have? Can you hit your spots? Can you feel the position? Can you do all those other things really, really well, you know? And I think you have to be athletic. You have to be, you have to have athleticism. You have to be coachable. Right? Like, how many guys have you seen that are just, like, not coachable? And you're like, it's, it's like we're talking to the guy after a while. He's not listening. He's looking right through you. You're talking to him, and he's looking over there, and you're like, what's going on here? So you have to be coachable. Um, and you have to have a good baseball IQ. You have, you have to know the game. Right? Just because you can throw hard, run, run fast, and hit bombs. Well, do you know the game, though? Like, do you understand what's actually happening in the game? You know, are you going to be in the right spot? Are you going to be able to make the right pitch and be in the right position and during certain situations. So I think those are very important pieces of the puzzle. You're hundred percent correct. And we touched on kind of the comparing yourself to others in a way. And that's what I also want to go into is we have a lot of kids, especially on the West coast who get committed, you know, when they're a freshman and they have these verbal commits and stuff, speak to these high school kids who are comparing themselves to the guys who are D1, who are top-notch, and they're like, well, if I'm not at that caliber, then I'm nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have a lot of meetings with our players, and they'll come in, and and, and, I, and I know I did this too, man. Back in the day, it was like Miami, Florida State, University of Florida, LSU. Like, that's just where you wanted to go. If someone's like, where you want to go to school? LSU. I knew nothing about it. I just knew that. Skip Bertman was there. They won a ton of national championships and like, like that's the thing. And so kids will come in and you'll ask them for their college list and you'll see nothing but Vanderbilt and, you know, all these monster schools. And you're just like, oh, okay. And I'm not one to say, are you crazy? You can't play there. But what I will do is say, okay, let's look up some of the stats of the starting pitchers for Vanderbilt. Okay. You're throwing 83. Okay, fine. They're averaging 94. So if you're at 83 and they're throwing 94, I'm not telling you you can't go to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is telling you that you can't go to Vanderbilt unless you can find a way to take that 83 to 94. Like, let's just be real and realistic, but not just, you know, trash on their dreams, but be like, look, let's just make smart decisions. Is this a reality or is it not a reality? You know, and helping them that way. Okay, you have a 2.2 GPA and you want to go to UPenn and they don't take anybody under a 3.9. Okay, well, you have a 2.2. Two. UPenn is saying you can't get into UPenn with a 2.2 two when they're taken. You know, so I think a lot of people come in with just these where they want to go, but not enough people are helping them, you know, be able to navigate well, well, where, you know, where, where's a good fit for me? Cause there's a college for everybody out there, but these guys are, are just, you know, or they see their buddy and their buddy's committing and, you know, they're like, well, I'm better than him. Why I should be able to go there. And it's like, listen, it's also what the college needs. If they already have three stud catchers, you might be better than both of those two catchers, but then they might still not recruit you because they don't need another catcher. You know, they're, they're looking for a third baseman or a left fielder this year, you know? So it's like getting them to understand that. And it's like, we always say, it's like, it's like a marriage. Like you might love them, but they have to love you back. So you knocking on their door all day long and they're kind of pushing you off and they're not interested. Well, stop, like move on to the next place and just, okay, fine. Some people just keep on going and keep on going. It's like, it's just, there's another school out there that's, that would love to talk to you instead, but you want to go there but they don't want you to go there. So we got to make some moves and adjust, you know? So I think that's, you know, and kids see everything. Nowadays, everything is in front of their faces. Every kid that's signed, every, oh my gosh, all these sophomores are already committing and I'm a junior now, I'm late. I, I might as well not even try. I'm not, it's like, hold on a second. 
That's not the norm. You think that's the norm now because you see the kids that it is happening to, but everyone feels like they're left behind. Everyone's, everyone feels like they're behind the eight ball. Everybody feels like everybody else is getting all these things except for them, and that's not the case. You know, it's like so hard to get them to understand that and just ride your journey. Stay on your track. You're getting better. You're doing well. Like, just just stay with that. But there's just so much distraction out there that it, it, it's it's just really hard to help with that. I, I have four kids, so I, I totally get it from, from college to high school. to And it's just like, man, there's a lot of stuff out there. And, it, and kids have access to it so easily that... The stuff that goes out there doesn't have to be fact. It doesn't have to be truth. But everyone thinks everything they see or read or, you know, is fact and true and reality. And it's not always like that. You're absolutely right. I thought you I thought that's a great approach. And I think a lot of coaches should should listen to what you just said and, and take that approach. Um, look up the stats. Let you know, you want to go to Vanderbilt? Look, man, you need to throw 94 or, or you can't go there. Like Vanderbilt's telling you can't go there. And real, being realistic, I think that is the biggest separation. I think a lot of these kids, especially on the West Coast, it's UCLA, USC, you know, it's these big Pac-12, Power 5 conferences, Oregon State. And the reality is, hey, man, Vanguard is a great program. Westmont right. is a great program. Like, you can get drafted out of these schools. Lewis and Clark in Idaho, NAIA, has more national championships in NAIA than any other school. That school gets guys out. And I think that's the biggest separator, I feel, at least on our side of the of the country, is we don't have all those schools so so close um, where, you know, it's an easy, hey, let's go see five schools on a, on a weekend. It's, hey, man, you're going to drive from, you know, San Diego up to San Francisco. That's a two-day trip. Um, and I think abs- you're absolutely right. Being realistic, letting kids know, and I, I hope a lot of coaches listen to this and, and – you know, stop fluffing their, their guys because the reality is there. Like the, the teams will tell you um, what you need to do to be there. Yeah. I want to ask you what's step one for a lot of these kids, um, whether they're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or even a senior, what do you think that across the board is the biggest step that they should take in their development and even just getting themselves into college? Train, strength train, get stronger, get faster, that's what helps you get better. You can have a great swing, but if you don't get stronger and you know be able to fire your hips and be able to make the moves and get you know become faster, that that's how you get better, right? Like you have to train, you have to put in the work, you have to you know have a goal, but then have a process behind it. Okay, I want to go to LSU. Okay, I want to go to LSU. I'm throwing 84. I need to be able to throw 88. Then what's my process? Not just I want to go to LSU. That's my goal. But what, what's my track? What's my blueprint? What am I going to do and how am I going to get there? Okay, well, I got to take 100 swings a day. I got to make sure I'm working out three times a week. I have to make sure that I'm eating right. Well, now I can start checking the boxes every day. Now I'm building momentum. Now I'm building confidence. Now I see what I'm doing. Now I'm, now I'm on that track to where you, know, you're, you can then accomplish those goals by starting out with that and realizing that you know, everybody has a starting point. You know, everybody wants to just get to the finish line, right? And I have, there's so many guys, I, I, I put posts out about this a lot, is stop taking down your posts because somebody said that they didn't like your swing. Stop taking down your posts because someone said that you did something wrong because you're never going to do it perfectly. You could take Mike Trout and, and Aaron Judge and make a video and we can go in super, super, super slow motion and still talk about things that they could be doing better. And they're the best of the best of the best, right? So, you know, when you're a freshman and you have a good swing and you're training hard and you put something on Twitter like, hey, put in some good swings today, be proud of those swings because that college that's looking at it is going to go, all right, where is he three months from now? Oh, damn, his swing's getting better. Nice job. Oh, now is a year from now. You're able to go, look where I was a year ago to now. But kids will be like, nope, I'm better now. I'm going to delete all these. Okay, now, now I'm going to delete all these. Now I'm going to... You know, so they never find the perfect thing or the perfect video or the perfect CRV. They're trying to make a college recruiting video and it's like every week they're getting better. So they keep deleting what they did because there's always something better that they could be doing instead of going, hey, let it set, post it, be happy with it because that's where you are now. But here's where you're going. And you can always look back to say, man, oof, 
I had a long swing back then. Oh, man, I was so handsy back then. But now look at me. Well, that's great for everybody and every baseball guy, college coach, recruiter. They all know that they're seeing that and saying the same exact thing. You know, kids don't realize that when you go to a, a showcase in December, a coach is going to be like, well, he probably hasn't picked up a ball in, in two months. So I'm just looking at his movements and seeing how he looks and seeing how smooth he is, not how hard is he throwing. They know it's December, but kids go out there wanting to pump it. And next thing you know, January, their arms are sore and their parents are, you know, trying to bring them to every showcase possible. It's like that, that that's not that that's not what needs to happen. So stay on track. Be happy with your progress. Start from the bottom up. Start training. Give yourself a blueprint, and that's how you're going to get, you know, to the end result that you want. Yeah, trust in the process. Mm -hmm. Understand it is a process. And again, I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of players, you know, um, oh, my swing's embarrassing or something like that, and they delete it. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And and believe in yourself. That's the number one thing too. I mean. Confidence is king. If you believe in yourself, like who gives a crap what anyone else thinks? So, yeah. um, Duke, I I think this is. I could talk to you all day. I, I know I say that a lot, but I, I I could literally talk to you all day. Um, I have three follow up questions for you. We ask everybody. Number one is, what is your favorite food? Oof, man, I love lobster. I love lobster and I love snails. I'm like a shellfish guy. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite movie? Well, man, that's a good one. You know, it's it, it's kind of silly, but I, I would have to say that the movie that comes on and I watch it every time is Pretty Woman. When Pretty Woman comes on, I never can stop. Pretty Woman, Karate Kid, and Star Wars, the first one. Those three movies at any time when they go on, it's like a stop and, it's a stop and must watch. I love it. Favorite baseball player, dead or alive? Man, when I was younger, Ron Girdry, Louisiana Lightning was my favorite when I was pitching, and Dave Winfield, number 31, was my favorite as a hitter. But I love Mike Trout, and I love Derek Jeter for all the things that they stand for, like growing up. Like, those are the guys that would just have all the things that we're talking about, right? They're gritty. They go full throttle. They're just, you know, all about the team. And those, but back way back in the day, those two Yankees were, uh, were who I who would, would be who I watched when I was younger. Well, thank you so much, Coach. We appreciate all your time, Duke. You're the all man. Right, if you guys, if you if you're in the area, please go train at Zone. They they're, they're getting guys to the next level. They're really doing a great job. And Duke, we we appreciate you being here. And and uh, I'm just excited to see some more videos that you guys post uh, week in and week out. Let's go. Thank you. I'm Duke Baxter with Zone Sports Academy, and this is the Baseball Playground. Like and follow on Twitter and YouTube.